tune into this fight because I'm about to beat the shit at this kid, bro. Uh, I'm Rafian Stocks, Bellator champion, and tune into the Don't Tap podcast. We have um, an interesting weekend. It's been a rough couple weeks that we've had on the Don't Tap podcast as far as picks. A couple spots where we were just way off, a couple spots, bounces didn't go our way, but we will move on and uh, take a look at this weekend's card. We have UFC Fight Night, Blades, Pavlovich. We're going to sort of do this a little bit differently this week, um, dividing our time over tape and looking at Bellator as well, two over the two two uh, cards on the weekend. We're going to pick some of our best spots over the three cards, maybe put together a fun parlay where you can decide to get on or get off um, at every level. Um, not really a PRP. I don't want to play that game and, and do a full card PRP type situation because that's not our show. Um, more just with all the spots that we, we decide on, we can make it a parlay as well too because we're going to go real safe this week, as safe as we possibly can. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the spots for this weekend. First off, how you feeling after what has been a, a rough time? I know that my beard is still on my face and you may be confused by that. The beard will be taken off as of this weekend. Um, we have a little bit of a family thing. After that, the beard is gone. And I'm already in trouble. So, you win. Yeah, man, well, the Barbosa fight was close, so <laughs> that one could have gone either way. And you know, it, then... like, it wasn't really close because it, <laughs> it ended with a bad knee up the middle, right? So, you can say what it was before it was what it was, but, I mean... You can see Barbosa almost starting to time that and watch the shots and, and really see the footwork, and he was just lining things up. He looked like he was right where he wanted to be almost, like he was waiting for it. Yeah, and honestly, man, that was my biggest worry going in that fight. You know, uh, Unfortunately, with last week, man, like we saw what I'd say is a coming of age where he's had a lot of these younger guys coming in, and I think you as well as a lot of the rest of uh, the people that do this, had the expectations that the younger guys were going to prove to be the better fighters. And at the end of the day, they weren't, you know, we saw a lot of old vets get some victories, Pedro Munez, Edson Barbosa. And, you know, if you're somebody who bets dogs, man, you're making bank the last two weeks. Cause like anything else, man, you know, you see the same thing in MLB. We saw the same thing in NHL yesterday. Sometimes things that expect to happen, the odds makers expect to happen. We expect to happen. They just don't happen. You know, so this type of game, we're betting on people punching each other in the face, you know. And like anything, man, you know, you bounce back. Bankroll management is key in this game. And, you know, you win some, you lose some. At the end of the day, you ain't going to win them all. 100%. And uh, so before we jump in, uh, we're going to do this a little bit differently. But we'll do the main event no matter what, what our plays are going to be on it. And we will do the over-under on it, the likelihood of it, and what the, the line are. I found a decent line for fight starts round two, or doesn't start round two. Um, actually, no, it does start round two. I sort of like that idea, but we'll, we'll play around with that. But from there, we'll just sort of, you know, go down the card and skim over it quick and jump in our, our spots that we feel are good. Sound good? So let's hit the main event first. Uh, we had Sergey Pavlovich, 17-1-0, coming up against Curtis Blades, 17-3-0. and Um I mean, this is an interesting matchup because we have Curtis Blades, who's fought the who's who um, in the heavyweight division, and Sergey Pavlovich, who's been surging coming up, you know, wins over Tai Tuovasa, wins over Derek Lewis, uh, Abdur Rahimov, and uh, Green as well, too. Um, the guy's just a dom, like, he's a dominating factor, he's dominating force. He, he's landing about eight strikes per minute, um, which is devastating for a heavyweight competitor i mean and i think that comes from him actually also clipping guys dropping them and just rapid fire landing big shots as well too um but man sergey pavlovich definitely um a force but can he go up against the wrestling of curtis blades i mean that's really the issue there you have high volume striking from uh pavlovich but then we have high volume takedowns from a blades who's also surging with his style as far as his stand-up as well too and, and been getting better and better but this guy shoots at a high clip for takedowns he's landing about six per fight um, now, Pavlovich's takedown defense is 66%, which is interesting. But, um, man, if Blades wants to make this into a wrestling match, I know that you were sort of leaning Pavlovich, I think I sort of saw online, and, and some other people may be on that side. But um, I get the plus money for a heavyweight tilt. Why not? Um, 
But man, this, this is an interesting one. I, I think I'm on the Blades side of this one. I think that Blades is going to be able to to stand with him the way he needs to in order to set up his wrestling, whether it's chain wrestling or he gets him right out in the open um, with a double leg. Um, one or the other, it's going to happen. So I'm on the Blades side of this. Minus 155, sure. I don't think I'm going to make it a play. We may have some fun with it, you and I, but uh, we had wanted to make sure we made a pick for the main event. The one thing I do sort of like is I think this might get out of the first round for some reason. I don't think that someone's going to sleep in the first round. I think there might be some wrestling, and I don't think there's going to be any submissions or TKOs. Um, both guys are going to be a little bit tired already going into that second round. But I do like um, fight starts the second round at minus 135. I don't know if that's even going to be a play itself, but I was just trying to find something on the main event card to have some value because we are going to be taking a different approach and not hitting every spot this week. Take it away. Yeah, man, I do have to start with Sergey in this one. I think Curtis Blades, I think he's been around for a long time. <laughs> Sergey Pavlovich is only 30 years old. That's pretty much whenever heavyweights start to come into their prime and really start their career. Um, the worrisome thing with Curtis Blades is the last couple of fights, he's tried to engage a little bit in the striking I think we can learn a lot from how that Derek Lewis fight went with that uppercut. Curtis Blades isn't the type of person who really times his takedowns very well. And although he's t- people are as sorry, as well as he's able to get people to the mat, he's kind of sloppy in the approach of how he goes about it. So <clears throat> I think Sergey is going to be one of these guys that gets up to the top five very quickly and it can happen in this fight. Um, the line that I like the most on this fight, and it hasn't dropped yet, but on DraftKings, you can get uh, like how the fight ends props. And even if it's juiced up to like minus 500, I think it's a good parlay piece. Fight ends by KO. That way you're covering your end on both ways. <clears throat> I don't think you see a decision. I'd be absolutely astonished if you saw a submission. Um, it beats betting the minus 900 fight doesn't go the distance. So... But I do, do, you think, do you think this could get out of the first round? Do you like because I know you're saying I don't know if I agree fully. I think Blade just had some fights where he's been sort of hesitant with his wrestling and maybe shot a little bit from far out because he does shoot a lot of double legs. But he blasts doubles, man, and and when he lands those, they're they're devastating. But I get what you're saying. Like, are you thinking maybe a knee up the middle um, or getting caught with a counter on the way in? Yeah, like I, I just think that he's gonna come in here sloppy, right? And if you watch any Pavlovich's last couple fights, like he throws caution to the wind, so. It's just a matter if Blades can get on those legs quicker than Pavlovich can punch him. Because all it's going to take is one from Pavlovich. And we've seen time and time again, if he wasn't scared of Ty Tuivas coming after him, if he wasn't scared of Derek Lewis coming after him, I don't necessarily think he's going to be scared of Curtis Blades coming after him. Especially considering Curtis Blades doesn't necessarily have the power that the other two guys do. So he's going to put himself in a compromising position early because Pavlovich isn't going to wait for him to shoot. He's not going to have that opportunity to dance. So he's got about 15 seconds to get on those legs or maybe a minute, you know, maybe he'll be a little bit cautious coming in, but it's, it's not going to be long before he starts throwing bombs and, Right then and there, if, if uh, Chris Blades gets him down, I think he starts hammering away on Pavlovich just the same. So I think the over one round is a little sketchy. But that being said, I always bring this up whenever we talk about uh, round one finishes. Johnny Walker and Tago Santos went the decision. And uh, Francis Ugano won a decision. So, greasy heavyweights, it's hard to place over-unders on these ones. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even want to do any over-unders as far as picks this week because they've been burning the hell out of us. But I was just yeah. trying to find a spot like that. The whole idea of the round starts, uh, you know, it, it starts the fight starts round two um, as a play. But even that, I mean, there's not enough juice there or not enough, um, you know, meat in the bone there to really be excited about it. I don't think it, it's but... bad to take some chalk this week because there's a couple spots and we're going to run through them in a minute. But like the under 2.5 is minus 400. Don't get me wrong. Nobody's running to the window to lay that straight. But at the end of the day, if Pavlovich doesn't get him out of there, he's not going to spend two rounds on his back against Blades because Blades is going to throw bombs and the referee is going to get in. So I think regardless who finishes the fight, man, I think it's going to end in under three rounds for sure. But regardless, I think even talking about the main event, even though we're not really fully on sides as far as a specific podcast play, I think um, talking about different angles and different edges that you can look at is, is the important thing, right? So you guys tread the way you want in the main event. We're both splitting hairs on it as well, too. So we, we're not, we can't really make a confident podcast play on that unless we were going head to head on our beard and our beer and my beard is gone already. So it's not gone technically, but it will be. And I'm not shaving it back to back if I were to lose, cause I'll just get, she'll be like, I thought you were letting it grow in. And I'm like, no, I lost again. 
I got to shave it down again. Then, um, you know, it could get really problematic for everybody involved. So um, I digress. We will move on to the co-main event um, of the evening. We have Brad Tavares coming in against Bruno Silva. And just to quickly talk over this one, I mean, Brad Tavares, the vet, uh, been in the UFC at a higher level for a longer period of time. But as far as their schedule, both guys have had, um, you know, high volume of fights. So we have Brad Tavares coming in at 19-7-0, Bruno Silva coming in at 22-8-0. Silva can be had at the, as a dog, uh, plus 140, and Tavares minus 154. Now I'm throwing the line out there. I wanted to hear quickly what your thoughts were, because I think a lot of people are looking at Bruno Silva as potentially as a dog of the week. Doesn't mean we have to, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about what people are looking at. Do you think Bruno Silva... Um, is a solid dog this week? Do you think he does redeem himself, or do you think Brad Tavares, um, you know, outbets him and does what he needs to do? No, I like Brad Tavares a fair bit in the spot. I get the fact that he's old, but like Bruno Silva, man, the second this guy takes the slightest bit of a step up in competition, he gets beat. If I know people can say like, oh, like Gerald Mearshar, maybe it was just a fluke. It doesn't matter, man. Jared Mayer, uh, Jared Mearshar should never be able to style on anybody the way he did Bruno Silva. And we're not talking about a Bruno Silva that was tired out. Like, you know, Gerald Mearshart was in that fight the whole time. It's not like this just happened in, like, the third round. It definitely happened more in the third round than it did in the first. But that fight was way too close and competitive for a guy who's got a chin like Mearshart. Um I think Brad Tavares just probably, you know, he's known as being a striker. He's got how many, like 15 fights in the UFC and he's gone to the decision like 12 times. Like he's just one of these guys that goes out there and I points his opponent. So I like Tavares. He's got a good set with his hooks, his uppercuts, his shovel hooks. Like he's got, he's got some solid dynamic uh, striking with the hands itself. Um, and Bruno gets get sloppy, man. Like Bruno head hunts a lot. And in result, he ends up tiring himself out. Like if you look at his wins, you're looking at like William Terman, worst fighter in the world. God, I fucking hate that guy. Um, and then you have the the glass chin and fucking Jordan Wright, who I've lost more money on than anybody else because I keep betting him, thinking that he's gonna KO somebody, and it just five fights in a row just gets his ass kicked. It's the cannon from the glass canoe. It's the only <laughs> time I'll be. I, I'm making a little bit of a change to how I'm approaching things with a lot of things. I don't want to be as disrespectful because I just find that, um, you know, if you can't say it on TV or you can't say it on YouTube or you can't say it or you can say it there, but you can't say it when you're standing in front of them when they're on the mats, then what the fuck are you doing? You know what I mean? That's the way I'm going to start approaching it. I'm going to do my best anyways. Um, for someone who gets knocked out drastically all the goddamn time, I mean, how do you really approach it? I, I got to acknowledge the fact that, yes, they are a glass jaw, but um, he definitely is the cannon in the glass canoe, is Jordan Wright. And we were waiting for that, that KO on the other end, never never quite accumulated the weight. Yeah, and, like, I'll, I'll put this out there, right? Because I said, like, I have very little action on this card, but but I do have some spots I like. Um, if you're looking for value on this card, man, like, I really think this fight goes to, it goes to a decision. And Bruno Silva, by decision, is plus 750. Like, if you look at the way judges have been scoring fights, they've been scoring damage over volume. So there's a real uh, real world where Brad Tavares lands more strikes, but Bruno Silva knocks him down once or twice in the, you know, the second and third round, and he wins a decision. So if you're looking for pure value, that plus 750 is eyeing me out right now. Okay. All right, yeah, I mean, I think we were sort of back and forth in that one. I don't really have any sharp official picks, so we'll leave that off the card. The next play, though, um, we got Bobby Green coming in 29, 14, and 1. Jared Gordon coming in at 19, 6, and 0. Oh. And Bobby Green can be had right now for minus 250. And Jared Gordon plus 230. Um, you know, I've gone back and forth. Initially, when I saw this play, I thought Gordon or Green can stay off the fence. Green can stay off his back. And then Gordon will want to engage in actual striking battle because Gordon lands pretty at a pretty high clip as well, too. Um, but Bobby Green's a way better boxer. So I'm on Bobby Green 100%. Then I hear potentially retirement. I don't know if that how true, what was going on with that. But even if he were to retire, he's going to go into boxing. Like, that's likely what he's going to do. The guy likes money. He was just throwing around a $60,000 stack saying he wants to fight of the night. Um, so he's going to put on a performance. He's going to land high volume. So I like Bobby Green in this one. I, I am going to, you know, take the chalk on it. I think Bobby Green, minus 250, maybe – We'll, we'll put him in as a parlay piece um, if we put all our pieces together. But I think Bobby Green is going to land. I'm going to take a look at the strikes and see what they, they were gonna, they're going to put a strike number at. But 
Bobby Green's going to land and win. Um, what's your take on this one? Bobby Green, Jared Gordon. I, I know that there's going to be times where Gordon's going to be on him on the fence, trying to chain wrestle it down to the ground at points where he, he's not having success on the feet. But I think that Green lands more and Green wins a decision. Um, that's about it. What do you think? Yeah, man, I'm with you. I like Bobby Green a lot on the spot. I went back and forth on this one because, you know, the whole Patty Pimblet controversy of the Jared Gordon fight. But even then, man, like you look at uh, Bobby Green's fight against Drew Dover, like that first round was as close to being a 10 8 as possible, like without there being a knockdown, of course, because Bobby Green just completely styled on him. Um, I like the minus 250 on Bobby Green. I think it's a good parlay piece. I think it's a relatively safe bet. I don't like any props on it just because you know we saw like the ally quinn through the way he KO'd him bobby green's coming out here trying to make a point jared gordon gets hit a lot and if bobby green puts together some of those crisp combinations although i don't necessarily see it being the most likely outcome there is a good chance that he drops him and puts him away so but i'm all in on bobby green i like what you said about um <clears throat> about the points or about the strike numbers um on bet online they have point spreads where you got Bobby Green minus 3.5 points at minus 125, just essentially meaning that he's going to win all three rounds. <clears throat> um, I think he wins a unanimous decision here. Okay, sounds good. We move on to the next fight on the card. We have right now Lasman Lucindo coming in against Brogan Walker. Um, Lasman Lucindo coming in, um, she had fought against Uruguay. Um, I think it was out in San Diego on the card. They came in last minute and put on a big performance. Known as a grappler, more of a striker. Uh, Brogan Walker coming in off of the Ultimate Fighter, um, where she had lost, where she was the, the favorite, actually, to Juliana Miller. Um, but the reality of this one is, I'm gonna, it's going to be a complete stay off for me. I don't know how it's going to go. Brogan Walker could come out and look like a savage beast and put Lucinda in her place, or Lucinda could come out throwing bombs and... and try to grapple herself. So um, I'm staying off this one. What about you? Um, I like Lucinda, man. Like, I, I think she's a safe play. Like, I think she's going to come out here. I think Brogan Walker is absolutely terrible. Um, I think what we saw from her against, um, uh, I'm dropping the name here. Who's the girl that just lost everybody money not that long ago that beat her up on the. You know, Juliana Mill. Yeah. It, it the way Miller came in here, man, and even styled on her, like, I think this is going to be a walk in the park, man. I think she may even get Walker out of there. So I like her a lot, man. I think she's another safe parlay piece on this card. And I'm not one to parlay women's MMA because it burns me every time. But I think she's going to walk through Broken Walker. With what's been going on with us, we are, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be real concerned. We're, we are, we are blue this week. We are conservatives. We're putting out one bad or- minus 600 Montel Jackson. Okay. Bet your if life we savings put, on a, it. put together a parlay and the only thing that doesn't hit is the Sindo, I will I'll burn the <laughs> podcast down. It's All fucking right? done with it. That's what I'm saying. So I think I think we leave that one off, but I, I, I do, regardless of what we've done, is at least you put some pretty solid two cents in as far as what your feel your breakdown is. People can take a look at it. If they want to be jumping on it, we can still put it out online as well, too, as far as some of the things that you were looking at. Doesn't mean it's going to be an official play. Doesn't mean that it can't be suggested out there. Um Okay, next, next fight on the card, we'll take a look. We got Jeremiah Wells, Matthew Summelsberger. I don't know how to cap a Matthew Summelsberger fight anymore. I don't know what to do with him. Um, it's one of those, I do not eat green eggs and ham situations for me. Um, I can't do it. Yeah. Sometimes he comes out and looks great. Sometimes he comes out and um, although the striking is there, the power is there, I think all the tools are there. Um, we've been on the side and been sweating and, and ne- ne- like knuckle clenching all the way through the fight. So, um, I'm going to stay off of this one. I, I, I don't know if you have a, any kind of a take. Jeremiah Wells with some power in his hands, a little bit of wrestling, and Semmelsberger as well, too. And for any of you listening, if you're just jumping in partway through, we were doing a quick take over uh, the card, not doing a full breakdown on everything. We're picking a couple of spots, going about it a little bit differently this week, and then talking about Bellator at the end, just a little bit as well, too. So, Nick, take it away. Do you have any spots in this? If not, let's just jump to the next one. I'm this is just a show me spot. I want to see where Wells is at and see if Selma Berger just got a fluky win over um oh what's his name? For me though, I'm leaning Wells with with my feel on it, but yeah, I'm not making that that's my pick, but not making an official play. Ricky Glenn against Chagos. I'm just gonna make a pick right now. I'm going Ricky Glenn in this one. Your take. Uh I'm gonna go Ricky Glenn, but with no confidence. 
Okay, Ronnie Yaya against Montel Jackson. The only thing I was looking for for value in this one is Ronnie Yaya has been a guy for me that's, you know, squeaked out decisions, squeaked out overs for me so many times. Um, so I, I sort of was looking at an over situation because he is a vet. He, cl he clutches on to you. He digs in on you and, and gets in on those hooks. Um, and he's able to sort of cling to guys and be able to try to out grapple them the best way possible. But I, I don't know if he's going to be able to do that for long without getting elbowed and, and hit from Montel Jackson. This is one of the, the more favorite spots in the card. I'm not going to go even try to find props for Montel Jackson on this one. Cause I just don't, I don't like, I just don't want to touch it in, in, in that respect. The over was interesting to me, but for me, I'm staying off. But uh, Jackson, I think is the side. I think he is going to eventually catch Yaya at some point, but when, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be as early as everybody thinks. Um, yeah, to be honest, um, I think if you can get fight uh, fight starts round two, probably around you know minus two fifty, not a bad play. And uh, over one point five is minus one seventy five. And I don't over screw us, but honestly, I like that a lot because Ronnie Yaya is super durable, man. Like the guy's been in there with everybody. Hasn't been finished a crazy amount. And Montel Jackson is a good striker, but not necessarily somebody who chases finishes. And there is a world where Yaya kind of pulls it to the ground. And Montel Jackson kind of just sits on top, avoids the grappling, lands some shots, and, you know, necessarily rides this out wait. longer than it should be. Maybe we wait on that line to see once a whole bunch of money comes in on Jackson and, and money on the KO and where the lines move. Then we look at that round fight starts round two or over the one and a half. So I think it was a little bit better before I, for some reason that I thought it was a little bit better than minus 175. Um, Cause I just think it could happen. I think you could hold on to him and, and get him to the ground or at least cling on to him, backpack him, get him up against the cage. And, and yeah, he's sticky, man. Um, he's problematic that way. So um, I like sort of like the potential over in that, but any thoughts, any other plays on that one for you, or we, we more or less staying away from the chalk on something that shouldn't be so chalk. Yeah, like well, I think Montel Jackson's gonna probably piece like everybody else in the world on this card, but other than that, I don't have a real idea on how that fight's gonna end. Yeah, I don't know, man. I just think that there's a, a huge level difference there, regardless of the power and everything else. So I just I'm scared of that. I'm scared of the the strength of schedule. Um, so for me, it's it's gonna be a stay off that way, especially just way too too wide. So next fight on the card, we had uh, Norma Dumont, who we hit early and put up the play early at plus one twenty five, I think it was, or plus one twenty. Um, Norma Dumont, I, I think this really could be a pick 'em depending on Carol Carol Hosa and and how she shows up in this one. But um, it's gonna be a, a definitely an interesting. We have Carol Hosa coming in sixteen four and oh, Norma Dumont eight two and zero. Oh. Um, so the line did start, um, Norma Dumont was plus 125. Now she can be had at DraftKings at minus 115. Um, I mean, looking at this one, Carol Hosa lands six, uh, 6.14 strikes landed, 4.11 um, strikes absorbed per minute. And on the other side, 3.64 uh, for Norma Dumont and absorbed 2.04. So, I mean, Dumont's got the wrestling and so does Hosa. Hosa's been showing a little bit more wrestling in her past couple fights, a lot more takedowns, um, landing, you know, two to four takedowns per fight in her past, like three or four fights. Before that, she would throw higher volume, was landing at a higher clip closer to, um, you know, upwards around what would be like the 60, 70 mark for a three round fight. And then it, that sort of dipped off a little bit when she went, went into the wrestling side of things. Um, Dumont on the other side of things um, came in against Wolf. And although Wolf isn't a, necessarily a talented mixed martial artist, is a high level boxer, at least compared to mixed martial. I shouldn't say high level boxer. She's a, a solid boxer and is, has high level boxing compared to a lot of mixed martial artists. And Dumont outboxed her. Dumont went in there and landed bigger shots, um, ran some basic combinations, but was just not going to be bullied and walked her down and landed you know, beautiful one twos and doubled up on that jab and landed some big shots. Um, she has strong wrestling, strong takedown defense. If you look at Norma Dumont's takedown defense is 70%. Hosa's takedown defense is 72%. These girls are are probably, I mean, Hosa right now is landing about 1.67 takedowns uh, landed per fight and Dumont's 1.19. The girls are virtually almost identical except for a little bit more volume in the, in the striking of Hosa. Hosa has, um, you know, in the Betchkoya fight, you can see throwing flying knees, just jumping from nowhere. There is some dynamic striking there as well, too. Um, it's interesting, man, but I think Dumont at plus money was great. Now Dumont is the favorite. I, I get where it could be a pick him back and forth, and, and no one wants to jump on that line now. We got it early. That was one of our plays of the week. Um, and hopefully some people were able to jump on it. If you weren't, follow us on Instagram, man. Follow us on Twitter. 
Um, if you're following us and listening to us on Spotify or listening to us on something else and you're not following us on other platforms, then, I mean, it's on you. Start following us. That that was a line that I think that we've, you've already got value out of. So um, what's your take on this one? I think, it, you know, it's going to be a fun fight. I think they're going to they're going to go in there and bang, I think, for sure. You're going to see a couple of takedowns and reversals and scrambles. Um, I know you're on the Dumont side initially, but what's your take? Yeah, yeah, I like Norma Dumont a lot of this fight, but <laughs> I think that she's the stronger fighter. Um, I think that she'll be able to land the bigger shots and pretty much hold Gross up against the cage. And I said, just implement a style that's kind of grind. That's going to grind her out to a decision. I think the lines get, or I think the fight's going to be close. I think that's why the lines kind of flipping back and forth. As you said, we got into the value at plus one twenty early, but um, I think it's safe. And you know me, over two point five. Okay. Next fight on the card, we have Muhammad Usman coming in 8-2-0 against Junior Tafa, 4-0-0. I'm just going to keep it nice and simple on this one. I can't, I'm not touching this one. This feels like, with full respect, it feels like an early prelim on Bellator, on a Bellator card, where they're trying to build up somebody from the ground up, right? Like a Junior Tafa, they're trying to build from the ground up. Same with Muhammad Usman, they're trying to build from the ground up. Um, both guys have some talent, some power. I'm, I'm staying off of it because on the feet, someone could go lights out, it could go either way, and I just not really touching anything on this. And I hope that you don't tell me that you are either. No, nah, I said, I got no official play on it. It's just uh, one of these fights where we're going to wait and see who wins and, you know, what this uh, ceiling is. Usman got touched up a lot by Paga. Really just butchered that name, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but... um and Tafa, man, we really just haven't seen much of. Um, there's that world where Usman wrestles, which he isn't necessarily uh, known for. I will say uh, the one minus one ten on, um, on Tafa isn't a bad bet just because striking wise he should beat the hell out of Usman, but Usman's always gonna have that wrestling background. So sit back, watch, see who has the bigger ceiling. Sounds good. Next fight on the card we have Francis Marshall coming in at a minus one eighty two favorite over William Gomez, uh, minus or sorry plus one seventy five dog. Um. Then we have a, a guy who's 7-0-0, and, and then I'm going to, you know, I say that one respectfully was a prelim Bellator card, then I'm going to actually take a shot maybe on this one. I think Marshall's going to ride in this one, man. We came in looking at this guy as a guy who's going to be able to wrestle and grapple um, initially when he was coming into the Dana White Contender Series, and he went out and just, just styled in some striking in his last fight. So I, I like Francis Marshall in this one. I just think that he is going to be one of those guys in the future that we're going to see in the UFC for some time. Um, William Gomez coming over his uh, majority win over Aaron's, I think it was. I, I don't know if I'm fully sold on Gomez yet. Um, I think Marshall's just the side in this one. I think what where the value is right now, I mean, I wish I got him a, a little bit more of a minus, maybe 150, minus 155 would be great just because they are still sort of unproven as far as at this level. And I know that Gomez has a little bit more of a, a schedule than, than Marshall, but I'm on the Marshall side of this and I, I we may, I don't know if you want to take a shot at making this play or, or adding this in a parlay at a level. If you want, it's up to you. Yeah, well, I think um, I think we can make it a play. Just like, show me. Yeah, like I like Marshall for a bit. I think the fight's going to be close. Like I know that over-unders have been screwing us on this man, but like I like the over his fight again. Like there's just – it's kind of what's more sticking out to me than the actual money lines. Because Gomi, if it stays striking, I think that he can actually land the better shots. But the expectation is that Marshall is going to come in and wrestle. So I like Marshall to get it to one. the ground. And <clears throat> he probably rides us out to a decision. Um, I think if it hits the scorecards, it'll be close. I just don't see a finish in this fight at all. Like Marshall beat Rojo. Don't get me wrong. I, I was honestly on Rojo in that fight. Poor life decision on my part. But um, So you don't want to make a pick and leave it to the judges is what you're saying. I get yeah, it. Yeah, I think it could be close, man. I'm with it. I'm with it. I understand. Um, I want to see how strong you feel about this one because I've been sort of teetering on making this a play, but I, I, I'm i not fully as confident as, I don't know, I'm back and forth, man. Priscilla Cashware coming in for our 12-4-0 against Karina Silva, 15-4-0. and And what is the line currently sitting out for this one? Uh, right now you got, what's that here? Priscilla is sitting at uh, plus 160. Yeah, I mean... I don't know. I think Silva's going to, I think she is legit too. I think she's going to be at the high level um, in, in the women's division in the bantamweight. Or sorry, in the fly. Is she? Wait a minute. Is Cachuera coming down and wait? What's the deal with this one? It, 
I do not know. What is this fight being had at? Let's. Well, I don't care if I have to cut this out. The fight is at 125. So she is coming down in weight from the bantamweight division. So she's cutting more weight. How's yeah. that going to look? It's a good question. Yeah, so Priscilla Catchwear coming down in weight. And I'm not sure. Let's just check, too, before we go back on. Because we're going to be done this in a second anyways. Um, did she go down last fight or no? No, her last, last weight was 135. Okay. So with Priscilla Cachoeira coming down um, to the flyweight division, I don't know how that weight cut's going to go. I know that she is a banger. I know that she, when she gets starts touching you on that chin, she starts, you know, landing more and more high volume with, with some power. Um, but man, Karina Silva, I think, is the real deal. And I think for whatever, like, if you, you said the line was what? Plus 165. And minus 190 on Silva. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is a little bit too wide right now at this point, but I think she is the real deal. Do you, do you see this a lot? Anything being playable on this one, especially knowing the catch is coming down in weight? Um, weight, weight I think Silva's one. probably the side. For the thing with uh, Priscilla, she gets finished in every single fight. So I think right now they only have the over 1.5, which I would not touch at all. But I think fight doesn't go in a women's fight is kind of a very – it's not out yet. There's only 1.5, and I can't bet a minus or an over or an under for 1.5. No. We'll see what fight doesn't go. Is the, what's over... the 1.5 sitting at? Yeah, uh, right now it's already kind of juiced, to be honest. Yeah, it's yeah, in yeah. at over 1.5 it. is minus 150. The under 1.5 is plus 120. So, like, they're expecting violence for sure. And a lot of people are probably already looking the same way. We're trying to look to trying to find value <laughs> on different spots. And this seems to be a spot where I think a lot of people are feeling pretty confident for Silva. I think she is the real deal. She's, it's going to be fun to watch her in the future. She gets more confident um, in the UFC. The next fight on the card, we have Baccarel Dana, 12-4-0, coming in against Brady Highstand, 6-2-0. Um, with this one, it's going to be a stay off for me, too, because, I mean, Highstand is a high-level grappler. Um Dana is at times where he, he gets lost a little bit, has problems finding the chin, but at the same time, there's so much power there. That guy touches your chin and uh, you can go to sleep. So I'll probably stay off this one as well too, but uh, you, you have a play in this one. You seem pretty solid in, in a side here. Yeah, I like Dana a lot on the spot, man. I think that he's just going to be able to land the crisper shots. I know a lot of people are saying he's gotten taken down in a lot of his fights, but this guy on the feet, man, is just so dangerous. And I think he's going to be able to land the better shots and, um, either KO his opponent or ride this out to a decision. Okay. I mean, I think as far as the cards, um, so what you, maybe for you a play would be Dana Baccarel, um, KO or decision. Yeah. Want to do that as a safe, safe, but a little bit of a prop. Yeah. Um, so let's find that line while I'm, while I'm going through things. If you want to just find that line quick. I don't think they're out yet. I just checked DraftKings, which is where I usually don't have to, but we'll say that's going to be a play, KO or decision yeah. for Benat, Dana Baccarel for you. You may just make it a play. Um, I'm not fully sold on it, but as far as uh, high stand, I mean. Um, okay, Cashware, Silva, no play. Francis Marshall, you've talked me off at making a play. Let's just watch it and enjoy. Junior Toffa, Mohamed Usman, no play. Dumont, we got in at plus 125. That's going to be put out again as a play, a podcast play at plus 125. Um but really, I would from this point on, I'd say just enjoy it. It's going to be a solid fight to watch. Um, Ronnie Yaya against Montel Jackson. I think if we can find, um, you know, fight starts round two gets a little bit better for us um, and not minus 175 or whatever it's currently sitting at. Um, that might be a play that we'll take a look at. And I know that you're big on Lasman Lucindo. I think we should just tread lightly on that one. But uh, if you we want, want to put that out as a, a, a you know suggested play for yourself, I'm with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Green, I, I think that even though he's used the R word, I think he wants to get into boxing um, and showing that he wants to win fight of the night. He's going to throw some 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 volume in this one for sure. Um, you want to make this podcast play as far as it won't be necessarily money line, but we can parlay it with some stuff. Yeah, for sure. OK. And then I know that you were pretty heavy. Well, you seem like you got a pretty solid angle on Brad Tavares, so that we're not going to make any kind of plays on that one officially. Um as far as your breakdown, you you were pretty heavy on Brad Tavares, uh, either getting Bruno Silva out of there late or dis decision, correct? Yeah. So if you were to suggest it, but maybe not that even if we're suggesting podcast play, maybe a KO or decision prop would for be sure. another play for Brad Tavares. Yeah. 
Fair enough. And in the main event, we were just taking a look. I mean, we, we had so many things we looked at. Maybe fight starts round two or under two and a half. You're on the Pavlovich side. I'm on the Blades side of things. You can look at takedowns depending on where those lines are at because that's telling you where Blade success is. But uh, no real specific play, I don't think. Did you have anything that you wanted to make as an official play? No. So as far as the plays, it's Bobby Green. And, man, we were pretty, actually, pretty, pretty thin. Do you still want to make – do you think Norma Dumont, no matter what, at the value that she's at right now, we make her just a play as well too? Yeah, I think we make her a play. And then I think we do uh, uh, Bobby Green. And I said this week's a little chalky, but whatever you do, Bobby Green and Montel Jackson, plus, uh, minus 174. <clears throat> I said you're not getting much plus money on it, but the key is to win. So, Yeah, I can't make – I can't trust Montel Jackson with that kind of chalk, if I'm honest. Like if you were to say – you know, let's pick a chalk, some chalk that that's parlayable. I don't know. Um, I just don't trust that guy. He's look, he's fight IQ at times is something that we we've said is an issue, right? So it's fair. I can't. I don't know if I can do that as far as a parlay. We may have to put out the uh, official play for that later in the week. But let's take a quickly look in the the last couple of minutes here. Um, Two lines to look at. We got Rafi and Stotts against Patchy Mix. I just want to do a quick breakdown of that before we go into the Bellator podcast for tomorrow. Um, Rafi and Stotts can be had right now for minus 137. He started at minus 152 in the opening line. So some loves coming in on Patchy Mix, and I see why. Um, what's your quick sort of take on that one? Patchy Mix against um, Rafi and Stotts, who I know Mix, you know, he's got the backpack and the grappling, and, and the striking is getting better. But we have a very well-rounded set from Rafi and Stotts. What's your take on this one? Yeah, man, I like Rafi and Stotts a lot in this fight, man. Patchy Mix is a very good fighter, <clears throat> but um, I think Rafi and Stotts has all the tools I think be the faster, quicker fighter and kind of control this fight anywhere it goes. Yeah, I, I'm going to do more of an in-depth breakdown tomorrow, but I think that um, just being able to scramble, use his defensive wrestling, I think he's going to be able to um, essentially do what he needs to to stay off the ground as much as possible. I think he's going to find himself on the ground at points, but be sound um, with his defense as far as his submission defense as well too. Um, and he, he's just going to be able to tag him up on the feet like wait, like the striking levels and like you were saying that the, the speed and the agility is there as well too. So I just think that we're getting the, even at minus 137, I think Stotts is a steal in my opinion. Um, people call it bias because he's been on the show, but I just think mix that we're confusing Sabatello's wrestling for Mix's wrestling. Mix is not, doesn't have wrestling like any Sabatello. Sabatello was able to get Stotts down multiple times. I don't think Mix is going to be able to do that and win, especially in five rounds. I don't see him submitting him and I don't see him doing this multiple times. And as time goes on, Mix maybe gets a little bit more tired. Stotts is going to start to take over and land volume. So uh, another spot I wanted to look at quickly was Danny Sabatello at minus 500 against Marcus Breno. And I just, Curious about this one. I'm going to talk to Josh Hill about this one tomorrow. I mean, Danny Sabatello, the wrestling is there. It's so high level, but on the feet, it's not quite there, at least at a Brano level. Brano went in against Josh, and, and I we didn't see him coming. Like, like nobody saw that kid coming. Fast. His footwork was there. His agility, his, his hands. Like, the guy's got hands. On the feet, this is not a minus 500. In fact, I think the line's even flipped to um, Brano being the favorite. So, Three rounds, does, does Sabatello hold him down for three rounds and win a wrestling decision? I don't know. Like, Or does he submit him? Or is that what we're thinking? I don't know what the line I, – I, I want to dig into this one a little bit more and talk to a couple more people, but I just something to look at anyways. Uh, any thoughts on that one or any any takes on anything else on Bellator that you want to throw out there? <clears throat> uh, no, I mean, um, a couple of plays that I like. He's got Kai Kamaka, minus 195 against Adil Edwards. I think that's a pretty good play for especially for a Bellator fight where, you know, usually you pay a, a lot of chalk. <clears throat> um, another spot I like is Ray Borg at plus two hundred five. I think this fight's gonna be a lot closer. I understand he's the underdog. I think he's the rightful underdog, but I don't think he's a plus two hundred five underdog. So if you're looking for value on this card, he's definitely a guy that could steal the fight away from Jorge Haraguchi. And. Last, I gotta give you props on that one. That, that was pretty good. Go on. And the last one I like is, you know, big favorite, but Nancy Madero's, you know, he's coming in. He's somebody that the Bellator does want to promote. This is in Hawaii. There's a reason why they're doing this. You know, this is a setup fight for Yancey. And I'd be very surprised if he didn't get Charles Leary out of there. 
like once again, like this is a fight that they put together. He's facing a 40 year old dude who's on a two fight losing streak, seven and 13, has faced pretty piss poor competition. So, um, I don't have lines out on it right now, but I said you can if you can get Yancey Madero's by KO, you can probably take that minus 400 to at least a minus 150. And I think there's value there. That's good value. I think that's something we might look at as a play. And on top of that, too, even just that minus 400, man, that is something I feel more confident in as far as a parlay piece. That That's a chalk parlay piece I feel a hell of a lot more confident in um, as far as putting in. And we'll maybe put in as you and I talk throughout the week um, as that uh, as that formulates. So, I mean, everything will come out Friday officially as far as the plays. Um, and we will put together some some parlays. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep it simple this week. It's a little bit of a different approach. There's three fight cards. There's time. One thing I didn't let everybody know is I spent some time at House of Champions shooting some footage um, with Mike Malott, which is pretty awesome. We're going to start doing a lot more of that, a lot more documentary stuff, a lot more interviews, getting in tune with the fighters. And your, and your boy is going to start training again. Um, enough is enough. Um, I think I'm going to start doing some light boxing to start, um, move into a little bit of kickboxing, and then maybe get into some jujitsu. Um, but I need to get back to it. It's only going to help the capping um, if I'm working with people and even holding mitts at times. Uh, that needs to happen. And obviously aspiring to hold mitts for high level people is, is a far away goal, but uh, to start holding mitts in general, I think is important. Uh, it really helped me out a lot. So um, for Nick Eagli, I am Callum McGregor. We, we were a little bit sparse with our picks this week. We're gun shy to some degree and there's a lot going on as well too. So I, I'm okay with that. Um, we will put out official picks by later in the week. Um, a little bit of a chalk parlay mixed with a couple spots we feel really confident on. Nick's put out a lot of information this week, so you guys got to know there's value there, even if it's fading him or it's it's backing him. He puts out enough information that where you you start thinking about the fight, start understanding what's going on in the fight, and it gives you you know insight. You know, and you can take your angle, whatever which way you want to approach it. And that's what really you should be doing, anyways. Um, so for Nick Eagle, I'm Callum McGregor for Dempsey Farm. And everybody back in say, the day, I remember way back. back. Callum McGregor here with John Jones. Um, now, obviously, your, your fight, you're out of the fight against Rashad. Uh, it's an unfortunate uh, turn of events. How, who do you see winning that fight now? Rashad Evans, Phil Davis? That's going to be a tough fight to call, man. Um, their styles, uh, styles make fights. So, you know, look at Richard. We're talking about Rashad, and he's over here staring at me. You see him? <laughs> what are you looking at, Rashad? <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be a good fight. Whoever wins, you know, they'll, they'll be fighting me. Right. With the champ, John Jones. Follow me on Twitter.